Hello everyone and welcome to Uppsala Art Museum and this panel talk uh, on the subject light sleep as a decolonizing activity. I'll share some Nicholas and new modes of encountering museum objects. Uh, so with me today I have a wonderful panel with three speakers. Uh, we have Ali Sherry, the artist himself, who is the, the, the focus <laughs> for today's talk. And Ali, you're an um, artist and uh, designer um, trained in Beirut, where you also grew up, uh, and also in Amsterdam uh, in performing arts. Um, and you work in different mediums such as sculpture and uh, uh, film a lot uh, and uh, performance art and drawings etc and uh, the the heritage and the uh, connections between looting and uh, cultural heritage <laughs> in lebanon and the neighboring countries are something that you're you're uh, um, exploring in in very many different ways and then we have um, Michael Barrett, who's an ethnographer and working at the Ethnographiska, the Ethnographic Museum in, in Stockholm, uh, part of the National Museum of World Culture, the governmental organization in Sweden. And you're also active in uh, different forms such as uh, Cinema Africa, for, for instance, in Stockholm. And Rado Ishtok, who's a freelance curator uh, based in Stockholm uh, from Czech Republic. Based, uh, and um, you're also very interesting in these topics that we will discuss today, uh, such as decolonizing readings of cultural heritage. And um, currently you're also engaged in a big project where Ali is also engaged uh, connecting uh, the Gustavianum collections <laughs> with archaeological findings um, also to, to Egypt and the Nubian, Nubian collections and in Sudan. And um, so a new new artistic reading, so to say, of, a, of, of the cultural heritage. Um, so the topic today is, is the film Som Nicholas that is currently on display at the Uppsala Art Museum. And uh, it was shot in 2017 and it's a nocturnal reckoning uh, uh, with different art museums, not art museums, but uh, cultural historical museums in, in uh, uh, Paris. And um, there are, it was a co-production with the Jeux de Pommes in Paris. It was commissioned by them and um, also showed in, in a solo exhibition in 2017. And um, uh, we have a lot of museums um, in the film. Maybe you should. Um, can you recall all the museums, Ali, or should I should yeah. I list them? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's uh, it's shot actually in the Louvre uh, in Quai Branly, which is the ethnographic museum in Paris, uh, the Natural History Museum, uh, the Musée de l'Homme, the Man Human Museum. I don't know how you would translate it, and in the Hunting Museum, Musée de la Chasse. Yeah. So before uh, starting to talk too much, we will see a short trailer from from the film. It's uh, the actual film is 14 minutes long, and we won't won't show it here. But <laughs> but you you're welcome to 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 visit the museum as as soon as we open again. But um, please have a look at the trailer. So I have some images from from the museum and how how it's installed in in the space. I think we should also have a quick look at these. This is another art object that is also in the in the exhibition that we will come back to. Yeah, and um, 
here's some some images from from the big screen and uh, the small sculpture called grafting okay so you've all seen the film in 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 a different different settings um, uh, and um, so when i um I've, I've been watching this film i really i get the sense of of um, somehow of a, of a curious child looking at at the art artifacts for maybe for the first time and being very um uh, thrilled or 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 also um maybe there's some and some scare, scaring parts also of this of this experience, and and uh, I would like to ask you uh, first if you have uh, any um, personal memories of these mm. early encounters with art objects. So maybe oh. maybe Ali, you should start. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's actually so uh, as you had mentioned, uh, I grew up in Beirut during the civil war. So I was bo born in the around the beginning of the civil war. And that's where I spent uh, all my life. And actually, so my first time I ever set foot in a museum was at the National Museum in Beirut, which was actually in ruin. It was destroyed because of 15 years of war. And uh, we went uh, actually on a school trip uh, right after the end of the Civil War in 1991 uh, to visit the museum. And it was a very interesting experience to visit a museum uh, that is itself in ruin. Uh, so uh, this idea of the ruin becoming uh, the image of the ruin itself. Uh, so during the war, most of the artifacts, the small artifacts were uh, put in storage in order to protect them on several stages. Uh, uh, and the, 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 large, the large sculptures, which could not be removed, were first uh, put into um, uh, sand encasing, and then later on during the war, they were put into cement blocks. So the first time I went to a museum, actually it was an empty museum, almost totally in ruin, and with these large cement uh, blocks with a small image that, that showed what is inside these blocks, like saying, Inside this block, there is a statue, a Phoenician statue, or or the sarcophagus, or something like this. So it it was already, and that was the first time ever I set a foot in a museum, not even modern, contemporary, whatever. That was the only museum I ever visited, the first time, the first one. And I think this experience really remained with me. I mean, this this how objects can retreat to hide inside bunkers how they can disappear and leave on and become only a representation of become this small label and a small image and really rely on the on the faculty of trust of how we of of, uh, of uh, you know like suspending this belief and we had to trust that inside this bunker there is actually what the little label is describing so all these questions i think uh, for me, I think they still remain in my work. I mean, this idea of the objects that retreat to to hide, to to change, uh, to even to resist, uh, to resist uh, violence, to resist uh, uh, narrative of uh, you know like uh, uh, of the museum, to to resist oppression and how they can survive. I mean. Uh, there was a beautiful, there's a beautiful uh, short video that when you visit the Beirut National Museum that shows the decasing uh, of the museum where you see these cement blocks being torn down and uh, sculptures start to appear. I mean, it's quite fascinating. So it's kind of reverse of what a museum is. Uh, and I think this encounter, I mean, this uh, idea of the reverie of the of uh, the imagination of the uh, as i mentioned of the of the belief uh, in objects uh, started from here and that's i think what i try to carry with me even in the work uh Som nicholas yeah and you you can see it in, in many of your works i think yeah. Yeah. what about michael and rado do you have is there a certain moment or impression that really uh, yeah i think so yeah. yeah for me it was really early so uh, I was probably around six or seven, and it was in the County Museum of 
uh, Linköping, Öst, Östergötlands museum where I grew up in the south of Sweden. Uh, and it was human remains, and which is kind of, <laughs> come to think of it, it's something I think we will talk about more later on, uh, kind of typical in a way that uh, that is what is what I, it's my first first memory of a, of a museum is actually the remains of, of a deceased person. So it was from these archaeological excavations uh, in the neighborhood, or I mean, close by. Um, and I just remember that it, I was fascinated by them, and but also scared because, of course, as for many people here in Sweden, I mean, we, we rarely see dead bodies and so on. So, so it was kind of a, yeah, shocking in that way as well, and kind of scary, but also fascinating. Mm -hmm. Roger, do you, do you also have, have a story to bring into the talk? Or <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's very interesting how these childhood experiences, like early childhood experiences, like stay with you. And I think in my case, you know, I was born in Czechoslovakia or like, you know, in the part of this today, Slovakia, which is many castles. And uh, many of these castles have been like nationalized, so they're open as museums. And, you know, you, you could see like, you know, I don't know, paintings from 18th century, but next to that there would be some, you know, collection from some like African safari or something where, you know, these nobles traveled. And um, so it's, you know, back then actually I've quite often seen all these objects kind of in one mix. Um, and I think that's also something I'm kind of trying to revisit now in the current work that I'm doing. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So there is this um, very open-minded gaze, maybe on on these objects in, in the film, but also at the same time, uh, Ali, you're really um, trying to deconstruct these um, uh, these different uh, well structures that the museum is based on and that is really uh, not a beautiful story if you if you look look into it with with um, i mean colonizing the world and and and, and a lot of looting that is in this this um uh, uh this building so in the history and um so um, maybe um, Michael, as, as you're also working in an ethnographic museum, I know that you've been reflecting on these 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 topics a lot um, uh, as as a museum person. How how, how would you describe this this uh, working in this context with this history? Um, yeah, well, it's a uh, it's a constant, of course. It's something. Uh, and especially like me working with the collections from the African continent, um, mm. it's very difficult to to go past the idea that these are collected in a colonial framework where violence and uh, uh, occupation and uh, domination is, is kind of, a, it's a very, very important aspect of, of how the collections came to Sweden, for instance. So, so it's something that is very, um, it's constantly there. At the same time, uh, museums in the 20th century have created different types of, uh, shall I say, defenses against speaking about this. Um, and so some of these stories of the violent extraction of objects and so on have been kind of uh, hidden or yeah, you really have to search for them sometimes in order to find. They have been the objects have been reframed in different disc discourses over time. So there's been, you know, the idea that the modernists uh, kind of um, uh, found, you know, so-called so primitive ethnography. Uh, there are other types of discourses that have been, you know, used to. To talk about these objects so that are so you have to go through them also at, at times and have to kind of dig in uh, and it's also a matter of self-image i think that's especially here in sweden where people are kind of the, under the general belief that we did not participate in colonialism that we didn't have our own colonies and so on we were not part of the slave trade and slavery but of course we were in all on all counts we were part of of um, of this and lately i've been looking a lot at the the colonization of the Congo, of the Congo Free State, mm. where there were several hundred Swedes that were part of that. And we have collections from 
I think we have, a, I'm counting, I think we are about 70 collections right now that are from people that were directly involved in the, in the colonization of the Congo. And it's maybe 4,000 objects or something like that. So, so it's, it's definitely mm. a substantial history in, in mm. the history of our museum. And uh, Ali, did you have a sp special s strategy how to how to sort yeah. of uh, work with this with this topic and uh, in 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 the in the film? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting what Michael is raising this the question of violence uh, uh, and looking at you know like uh, in a way deciphering this uh, sometimes violence that gets diluted or like uh, in a way disappears uh, within the museum. But but also I think there's of course there's the violence that's directly uh, on the on the objects. Saying I mean with uh, with through looting or. Uh, 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 or you know, like a different uh, type of trade, but I think there's a different type of violence, which is in the structure of the museum itself, which is, uh, I mean, the the modern project of enlightenment uh, of the museum, like the foundation of the museum, uh, 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 which is classification, which is uh, you know, like with which is the separation between the, you know nature and culture, between uh, the self and the other. You know, I mean, this whole look at the. There's us and there's the other, uh, and of course, and you can trace it also even to the universalist uh, uh, project uh, of enlightenment. You know, especially uh, here in Paris. Uh, you know, like uh, uh, with the you know the project of the Universal Museum. I mean, uh, so I, I my strategy was looking at different types of violences uh, and and uh, a more structural one. And uh, when I mentioned, I mean, the choice. If you look at the, I mean, for some Nicholas, speaking of some Nicholas, uh, where it was shot, it was, uh, uh, there's, a, you know, there's like taxidermy animals, there's the Natural History Museum mixed with objects from, you know, like uh, Ethnographic Museum or the Louvre. Uh, and it's already, you know, I had to physically go into different museums in order to uh, construct a narrative that mixes these objects because these objects are not hosted in, in, in the same uh, geographic physical space. Uh, so already, I mean, this already uh, uh, is a form of violence for me. I mean, this is already where we're tracing back to, you know, like an ideolo ideology. And I think uh, whether national museums and, you know, or more universalist, uh, so-called universal museums, uh, ideology is at the essence uh, of these, uh, uh, these institutions. And I think it's interesting how, for me, I mean, my strategy was to see when does this foundation of this of this project collapse? Like when does, how can you push things to an extreme where where this whole uh, palace, I mean, sand palace that is, you know, uh, built on, uh, on, uh, on, you know, like centuries of, you know, like uh, colonialism and, uh, and uh, you know, like uh, uh, production of knowledge, how can these be pushed and confronted uh, in order to show their weaknesses and in, in order to show, uh, you know, like uh, their fragility uh, and bringing back up uh, the 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 force and the uh, of the objects and not of the discourse that is uh, putting these objects together. And how was the the process, the actual production <laughs> process? I mean, was yeah. it was were there a lot of mutual understanding or a I lot mean, of debates or or? I mean, or? it's interesting. Uh, I mean, so the project, uh, the, the beginning. I mean, the choice wasn't a choice of museums. I was more interested in certain objects. I mean, because, of course, the, the, the project was about the question of encounter, like how do we encounter these objects? Of course, the question of the gaze. Uh, so for me, I chose first objects that I want. I thought uh, through these objects, I wanted to to tell a story. Uh, and then it was the question of, you know, of the institution where these objects are hosted. And uh, funny enough, I mean, one of the most difficult uh, museums to work with was actually the Natural History Museum. Uh, not the Louvre, not uh, the ethnographic museum. It was, well, you would think, I mean, there's only uh, going back to the remains, animal remains or human remains and, you know, like natural objects where there's no, you know, like a author, uh, you know, uh, an author behind these things. It's the natural world. And this is what's actually the most difficult museum to to shoot into or even to walk into with a camera. Uh, so it's it's interesting. I think it reveals also, you know, uh, how these institutions perceive 
their role and how do they, you know, like how do they consider themselves within, you know, the landscape of other institutions. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I, but then, I mean, it was, we managed, I mean, to have permission to shoot in all these museums, but then it's also a privilege to be able to access all these institutions alone, most of the time at night. So that also was what, I mean, we have this, of course, the whole imaginary and fantasies about museums, you know, like uh, a night in the museum, you know, things that move at night and all this. And I wanted also to play with that. I mean, it's interesting to see how the, the ghosts, uh, of these places uh, start waking up if we listen carefully enough. It's it, I've heard from visitors coming here when the museum is closed also <laughs> that it was a really strong impression to take part of this film in a closed shutdown museum. Yeah. Yeah. So so what you basically do is that you you work with uh, the concept of um, light sleep as yeah. as a way of uh, I mean depriving the the the, the the gaze or, or 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 the faculty of seeing um, and instead you, you try to activate other other senses maybe Rado maybe you can also elaborate a bit on on this the the uh, the import that well the the history of the gaze and in in the context of of museums and and art uh, in I mean in relation to some Nicholas yeah I think like I'm not going to provide any kind of like long um um, genealogy of this, but um, um, one of the exhibitions that Michael has been working on has been the exhibition Black Atlas with uh, Jacqueline Ho and Nguyen. Uh, and even though this exhibition was not working with the collections per se, but more with the photographic archives, it was really interesting how Jacqueline managed to like turn the gaze back on the museum. So of course we can talk about the gaze of the museum, but there's also the gaze of ethnography and um, of course the gaze of the camera that is also being you know, seen as very violent and there's parallels between the kind of mechanical shots that the camera can make and the kind of shots of the of the mechanic gun, etc. And um, but um, but I think what was really interesting for me uh, thinking about Jacqueline's exhibition and Alice film is that in Alice film there's many of these uh, artifacts or belongings that are actually looking back at you and of course at the same time there's also this scene of um, uh, you know, when um, the eyes are being cut through, etc. But um, but the fact that, you know, the objects are also gazing back at you and you, you are not only kind of the, the visitor looking at the museum and as well as, you know, kind of uh, artists that you can gaze back at the mechanism of museum, I think that's something that's very interesting. Mm. Yeah, if I can add something, I mean, the uh, what Rado mentioned, I mean, this the film opens with this series. I mean, you saw it in the trailer of uh, inoculation. I mean, the uh, the eye being violently, you know, like poked out and and to lose the the sight actually, or lose even the organ of sight. Uh, and I said this as a precondition to enter the museum. Like before entering, you have to uh, lose sight in order to see. Uh, so it's like reversing uh, the gaze. Because I consider, I mean, we have lost. Uh, our gaze. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the, our you know, like neoliberal uh, contemporary societies have lost uh, the uh, the the fight of uh, of uh, of the gaze. I mean, we, we the desire. I mean, the, the the desire is constructed through uh, like a, mo a bombardment of images and and things you know from ads, from moving on the street, wherever we go, we are uh, looking at things that you know build our desires and. And we perceive objects through this, how this desire is constructed. So for me, like we cannot, for in a way, I, I think we cannot fight this fight anymore. We have lost it. So trying to look at, uh, as you mentioned, light sleep. There's this idea of having our eyes closed. Uh, but what's what's particular about light sleep, of course, is that uh, in comparison to a deep sleep, that uh, we are still aware. In a light sleep, you still hear voices. You can smell. All your other other senses are still present, uh, so you are still receptive to the world. But this receptivity doesn't go through the gaze. And of course, there's the idea of sleep, which is bringing these objects to the to the um, to the world of the imaginaries of dreams uh, and a way of you know like uh, how these uh, objects become haunting or how they can inhabit uh, the dream world. 
uh, by default of not being able to to you know like to win within the fight of the institution and the gaze of a you know like a normal visitor reading a label that uh, you know the Louvre have put next to a, a ancient Egyptian mask, for instance. So Michael, maybe you also have have some um, some comments on on this. Uh, I mean, it's basically Alice working with a flashlight also and and yeah. uh, and enlightening the the objects and and it's quite quite harsh also I, sometimes and and uh, so, so what, yeah no I, I was thinking when you spoke about this idea of I mean of fighting the gaze fighting the sort of the established way of looking at objects uh, and also of course as you're also commenting uh, which is something that the museum kind of encourages and and very uh, and tries to form and shape in a very very particular way, and of course, and that's a very large. I mean, that's a very huge contrast compared to, for instance, when I, as a privileged person working in the museum, having access to the objects outside of of the the frame of the exhibition. Uh, I was actually yesterday <laughs> in the storage uh, late in the evening. I was alone. It's, I mean, it's a huge storage. Uh, it's like hundreds of thousands of objects inside there. And of course, what happens there when I'm there alone is something that is, yeah, that challenges a lot. I mean, what you see in the exhibition room. Um, there are so many smells, for instance. There are sounds. There are there are vibrations in a way, uh, which I think I am imagining, but I don't. I don't think I am because it's also. Uh, I mean, these objects are extremely visually powerful sometimes, and and I think that's something that I found very interesting with your film as well. When you come, when you kind of defamiliar, defamiliarize yourself with the with the with the gaze. And you have these flashes of, you know, where you really see <laughs> the expressions that these uh, sculptures especially have. Uh, you feel, you know, the the power that they were given, um, their power to astonish, their power to to change, their power to to make you feel certain things, um, which are often missing when you when you're just seeing them through the vitrine, you know. So. Yeah. So it's hard to. I think it's very hard to to get to this. What what happens when you when you feel the weight of an object, or the smell of an object, or the feel the structure, the I mean the uh, the surface structure of the object? It's really something else. Um, but then, of course, how to in a museum setting try to um, uh, give back that kind of feeling it's it's mm -hmm. it's, it's impossible of course mm -hmm. because the museum in itself the, the museum as an exhibit space exhibition space is 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 doomed in a way <laughs> the format is doomed in a way because it's it's really hard to, to to go out of it and and we try i mean god knows museums we try to to, to find new ways to activate this uh, or try to bridge the gap between the visitor and and the object but uh, yeah it's super super difficult I mean, it's. Uh, I can tell a small anecdote because uh, I was uh, in Sudan, working in Sudan on a film uh, for the past years, and the, the National Museum in Sudan, you know, in Khartoum, uh, there, of course, there's, you know, there's uh, pharaonic sculptures, you know, from the Nubian uh, period, uh, and uh, there, I mean, ki kids can like uh, families would come and their kids would like be go on top of the statues inside the, within the museum and to take photos, kids are running between the sculptures. And there's this sense of, you know, like desacralization uh, of these things. Of yeah. course, your your first reaction is like, what, how how is this happening? But then you think, well, I mean, why not? Probably they're also, you know, like damaging in a way, and this cannot be sustainable. But also there is this sense of connection to history. I mean, there's, there's this feeling of, uh, you know, continuity uh, uh, within your own history where you feel, I mean, these are um, uh, uh, part of 
uh, of your life. This world, this is like this sense of continuity that is broken when seeing, you know, like people touching objects. Uh, well, uh, unlike when they are, you know, like behind vitrine and with a guard that is there uh, and with a specific light and, you know, like uh, everything that you've mentioned, which is the experience of any normal viewer. So so maybe on the peripheries, uh, there are museums that fight maybe consciously or unconsciously <laughs> these doomed institutions. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, it, that is true. That is true. Definitely. So maybe we can show some more images also from from. Uh the gallery space and, and the film. Um, Charlie? <laughs> mm. Ah, okay. So this uh, image is also from from, um, from the St. Nicholas film and, and uh, this, it's from the Musée de l'Homme, right? Yes. yes. And, um, and uh, it's especially with the eyes from, from, of, from Uppsala Art Museum and from the Uppsala context, we, they, they are quite sensitive in a way because it's cost of dead dead people right uh, actually, actually or maybe not that yeah. no, actually these were casts i mean that were done on prisoners in the colonies mm -hmm. uh, so they were uh, i mean it's uh, for you know of course for all the racial uh, uh, studies you know to uh, to uh, to study you know like uh, uh, all the race uh, racist theories the race theories mm -hmm. uh, and it's 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 quite impressive because there's the, the there's a scenography and when you go visit the musée de l'homme uh, these like uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, large amount of uh, of uh, plaster casts and every, all these faces with these closed eyes, because actually very simply because they had to put their face inside the, these casts. And most of these people don't didn't understand what was happening. I mean, what was happening to them. So you could see also a lot of tension in the faces. I mean, some faces are really, you know, like you could feel that they are, uh, you know, like they're scared or, uh, or you know, like because they might thought maybe they are going to die. I mean, they don't know what's happening to them. And uh, I, I th find it fascinating how these moments of, you know, like uh, uh, capturing, uh, you know, like uh, the morphology uh, of uh, people from the colonies and what does it what it captures actually is the moment of, you know, uh, of fear, of violence uh, and of course, these eyes that become it's like these eyes that have been you know like uh, it's like they're waxed in it's like someone you know like closed your eyes forever uh, I, and it's actually what started the the part in the film when you see me put a plaster uh, cast around my face and then again and the photos you meant you saw you you showed cutting it and uh, but this time not cutting to to uh, to remove the the organ of the eye, but cutting it to see. I mean, we have to cut this plaster uh, mask in order to be able to see again. Uh, it's uh, I find these uh, the, these casts quite haunting. Actually, I mean, they're quite strong in what they tell. Mm. And in Uppsala, we have this this history also with um, racial um, bi biological institute also. Um, uh, that studied eugenics from the 1920s and 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 uh, actually until 1958. Yeah. So there's a, a, a really dark history in, in Sweden as well. Uh, maybe we, we have also an image from from actually the the setting of Monsieur de Lhomme. If we could show that one um, with how it's displayed in the in the gallery mm. space. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. That's yeah. the photography. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. So maybe it's not so much critique in this this display. It's more more of a oh. praise of <laughs> yeah. the diversity of <laughs> humankind. Yeah. 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 Pretty, the, sorry, yeah. Michael. So, no, I was just going to say there's so much power in that image as well. I mean, the mm. display of power. I mean, the yeah. sort of the the um, the uh, the power to be able to do that, to be able to to make this display and to make this statement about about the world, is very strong. That's that's just what, what I was going to say. And it's very much Paris, isn't it? I mean, this encyclopedic knowledge, as, yeah. as you also talked about yeah. our, earlier, Ali. Yeah. 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 And the previous image was actually from the Ethnographic Museum. Um, yeah. So maybe we can show that one also with the um, crates, the cast. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, so and these, these yeah. yeah, these are have the same uh, context. I mean, these are these were ordered by uh, the museum from Berlin because Berlin was kind of a center where they made a lot of these casts, and some, just like Ali said, were from prisoners of war in like Namibia and places like that, from very, I mean, violent and brutal circumstances. Other were from, others were from like uh, these shows, like human zoos, as they were sometimes referred to. Uh, that visited places like Berlin, Paris, even Stockholm. Uh, so people from all over the world would come. And and that's also one of the places where they would make these kinds of gypsum casts. Um, and we also had a, uh, Swedish ones. So it's so it was also, of course, it, there's also a class dimension there, of course, where, where people, for instance, uh, people that were in mental institutions in Sweden were subjected to this. Uh, to the same thing. So people in the colonies, but also people from lower classes or from you know uh, different types of institutions and so on, were subjected to the same uh, things. Uh, and uh, I've heard earlier, uh, Michael, that you often get this this um, uh, this saying that the museum is a space of death, <laughs> and, and I mean. Uh, uh, and that that these these are the reactions also on 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 the on the objects in in I mean on the history of the of the of the, of the looting and and what the of the, of the different wars and conflicts that also sort of are inhabited in in the museum and and uh, with yeah with yeah I think it I mean it refers to many different things I mean that is one of course how they were how they were brought to the museum and all the the death and destruction that was involved in that, but there's also uh, there's also the sense of this, the deceased people that have used these objects that have made these objects. Uh, there's the notion of you know musical instruments that are dead that are no longer played, techniques that have been forgotten, and materials that are no longer used. And then of course there's this grand narrative around the museum, uh, especially the early museum. Of ethnography, where uh, this idea of salvaging, uh, so at the same time as people were, as they were collecting or hoarding objects uh, from these cultures that were being destroyed, they were speaking about saving culture. So, um, so there's this whole idea of, you know, uh, this collateral damage of people uh, when whilst we are kind of marching towards civilization. Uh, so there's death in that sense, but then of course there's literal death. I mean the the I mean the, the casts as we saw, but also human remains. Like only in, in our little museum in Stockholm, there are 800. There are remains from 800 individuals uh, collected from all over the world. Uh, uh, so of course there is this idea of a graveyard or a cemetery that a lot of people have been uh, kind of bringing up. I mean it's true. It's actually true. There it is. A, a graveyard and a cemetery in a way. Uh, I mean, literally, it's it's also a cemetery. Um, so there are many ways, I think, which which this is true. Um, but I mean, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, and I mean, you, you as, as, as uh, the Ethnographic Museum, you also engage in these um, processes of, of restitution or repatriation um, yeah. as one way to... <laughs> try to heal <laughs> some of the wounds maybe I meant and um... yes I think it is I mean it is a it is an attempt to do I think that's where you should see uh, this new discussion around uh, restitution and repatriation that it is uh, I mean firstly of course it's something that has been insisted insisted upon from the original places where these objects came from for a very long time. I mean, restitution has been something that, uh, for instance, Nigeria have been insisting on since the 1930s or even before that, and many other countries. This is, has been kind of a recurring theme. So it's not new in that sense, but why European museums are doing it today, I think has to do with the idea that museums need to be more ethical spaces and more moral spaces and take that seriously. I think that's, so there's a demand, I think, from especially young people today. Um, around that that museums need to be i mean to to look at their own history look at themselves and then sh start to act according to you know certain ethical and moral principles 
so I think I think that is an important aspect. So so this I think where there are spaces for healing and and uh, yeah dialogue to use a very uh, uh, difficult word. But anyway, yeah. And the the museum has also been sort of in, in the center during this this uh, Black Lives Matter uh, debate or 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 process going on also. That is very I mean very very current <laughs> and and uh, even today we have uh, yeah the, these these topics are, are are still coming back all the time yeah um i'm one another um, example is actually the the gustavianum the the museum in in uppsala with the with the collections of of um, mummies for example and they they plan to reopen in a few years but they also have this discussion whether they should show dead bodies in a mummy or not and uh, and of course I, I i think they will well the the way of putting is this of course that that we 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 need to to have have a, a, a discussion about what we show but but still <laughs> these are are also objects that that we would like to to um, not hide away anyway. I mean, it's very difficult questions, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's sorry if I can say something. I mean, mm. it's interesting to look at when these uh, human remains uh, have uh, become uh, became uh, artifact considered as artifacts. I mean, uh, I, I uh, there's I mean I know in in Egypt I mean uh, in the 1800s I mean uh, mummies were not considered artifacts and therefore they could be sold and I mean that's why there's like people were just like uh, um, digging up uh, mummies and they're directly s uh, selling them because they don't fall uh, under the law of being artifacts and then the law had to be changed and uh, and the human remains started to become artifacts in order first to protect them or at least to have them under the authority of you know like the uh, um, of you know like the the archaeological authority uh, so it's interesting uh, to see this shift of uh, of when we start considering uh, human remains as uh, uh, as objects of study of interest that you can you know like can manipulate and dig up already that's already a, a quite a transgressive gesture i consider digging up the dead uh, uh it's it's very interesting and i agree i mean this whole image of the 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 cemetery the museum the death uh, in the museum is something central also to uh, to, to in my work and uh, and of course uh, it be, brings with it the idea of resurrection if they, if they are dead then someone need to resurrect them so looking at both uh, both sides of the of the coin and the light sleep is the resurrection yeah. in the <laughs> in the Sub Nicholas yes, film. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, sending them to the to the world of uh, of dreams and nightmares, and uh, uh, that's the only place where these objects could be resurrected in the imaginary. I mean, if they become part of the imagination and not anymore part of a discourse, so mm. shifting the, the focus. Yeah. Um, so the other day, uh, me and Rado, at least we attended a seminar listening to uh, the curator Candice Hopkins, um, also talking about artifacts as, as um, uh, that, that the, the, the term is maybe not so, so suitable because it's really talking about a dead object, not, <laughs> not something that you, that has agency and that you can, I mean, uh, are in this special context so so and then she suggested cultural belongings um, as, as another uh, word um, so maybe Michael and also uh, Ali you could maybe you can tell me a bit more about how, how, how I mean how <laughs> how can we <laughs> relate to these objects in another way in the museum setting I mean how, how, how could we not maybe rename them, but but uh, but uh, find new ways of, of engaging with them. Do you have a strategy at the ethnographic museum? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, okay, the last couple of years I have been working on a project which we call Ongoing Africa, which is kind of a platform, curatorial platform, uh, kind of experimental workshop <laughs> where we've been engaging with different types of experiments, but, you know, inviting 
different types of audiences, but also artists and scholars and activists and organizations to think together with us around these, the significant significance of these objects and perhaps how we can uh, imagine them in, in Ali's sense uh, in the future. I mean, how they can be part of a new, new imaginations and new contexts and so on. Uh, so, so it's kind of a series of workshops, uh, uh, residencies, uh, public events, artworks and, uh, you know, studies. We have, for instance, one project which is working together with the Women's History Museum of Zambia, which is a small museum without a building in Zambia, but they collect women's histories or women's stories. Uh, and they are trying to, and they realize, of course, like people do in many African countries, that most artifacts of their history is not found in their own country anymore, but it's found in Europe. So they they are kind of reached out and wanted to connect with objects that are from Zambia in our collections. So we're doing that digitally, but we're doing it also in different uh, collaborative ways through design, through um, community activities there in Zambia, but also, so using the digital trying to rematerialize objects in the digital domain, for instance. So, yeah, I mean, there are, so, there are many different ways you can do. I think the most important thing is that you, you do it respectfully and you try to use all the means possible to, to open up these collections so that they are not only for us. I mean, so repatriation and restitution can be part of that, for instance, but also, you know, just the fact of, yeah, inviting people other people <laughs> mm. yeah maybe we can show some some images also from uh, from the different art projects that you've conducted at the ethnographic museum um, so here's one example of yeah so this is this was uh christian Jampeta, who's uh, who's an artist uh, who works well in different mediums but this time he made a uh, we commissioned together with Maria Lind from Tensta Konstal, we commissioned a film or video work, um, which also kind of focused on the Congo actually, and on the, and the Swedish mission in the Congo, which we have large collections from that. And it's that kind of, that history is kind of entangled with the museum's history very strongly. Uh, and he looked at especially uh, Sven Nyqvist, who was a Swedish cinema, cinematographer who filmed with Bergman and so on, uh, his parents were missionaries in the Congo. So he looked at that collection and uh, he made kind of a collage, so kind of spanning now and then and um, involving historical figures or people uh, that are no longer with us, but kind of were given a presence. So people like Winnie Mandela or um, yeah, uh, Robert Mugabe came to watch a film by Sven Nyqvist. Very interesting work uh, uh, in the way that it, you know, patches together this very difficult history. Um, and, and then, then and there's yeah. an up upcoming project also. Yeah. With... yeah, and that also concerns the Congo, actually. So it's with the artist Roberto Peira, who's a Swedish uh, artist. Um, and he has been his starting point were some sound recordings that we have from, from the Congo, and which is also from the missionary context uh, from the 1950s and 1970s. Um, and then he's making kind of intervention in, inside the, the museum. Uh, so looking at this history and the sound and, and the images and the objects from that time, but also looking at the, the very fraught history of the museum dealing and describing this history. So, so it's in an exhibition which is about the mission, the Swedish mission in, in the Congo. Uh, and he kind of, yeah, disrupts that in, in different ways inside the exhibition space. Sounds very interesting. And um, Rado, you're also, I mean, you're also in this um, project, All That Is Solid Melts Into Water, that, it, that you're working on. Uh, you also are very interested in, in, in uh, this way of reconnecting to the art objects both for for different groups that uh, that belongs to the Nubian Nubian <laughs> uh, collective but, and uh, but also um, maybe as, as, a, as a 
museum visitors in Sweden, I guess. So maybe you can tell us a bit about this uh, project with a lot of layers, one must say. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, I think I would just like to briefly react to Michael and I think to this like idea of the museum as, you know, graveyard or cemetery. And this is, you know, quite often repeated um, parallel between the museum and the mausoleum. And, you know, it's like a place where, uh, of course, the death uh, the dead are also waiting uh, for the resurrection. But I think we can also look at, you know, these different, uh, not binaries, but maybe, you know, look at the same thing from different perspectives and maybe something that Ali, like, touched upon that, uh, you know, like, if you look at the same practice uh, from one perspective, it looks like archaeology. From another perspective, it looks like grave robbing, basically, because of, you know, not only the human remains, but everything else that has been, you know, laid in the in the graves to uh, to make the journey of the you know the souls into uh, into the other world, and um, and also going back to the violence, I think it's you know like uh, a lot of the violence has of course been committed you know for uh, let's say like economic and political and territorial gains etc. But there's also a lot of violence that has been committed in the you know in the name of knowledge of either gaining knowledge you know through these like very extractive um, disciplines or kind of like spreading knowledge uh, or kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say fake knowledge, but, uh, you know, like the practices of missionaries and kind of like trying to impose, you know, certain kind of like knowledge and um, which is not only connected to, you know, beliefs connected to, um, you know, to God, but also like uh, about medicine, et cetera, et cetera, this kind of like other um, kind of gods we believe in, I don't know, in our societies. And uh, in relation to, um, you know, the project that you mentioned with working title, all of the solid melts uh, into water. I think that's another example because we also kind of think that these practices are connected to the 19th century or early 20th century. But this project looks uh, into the 60s and um, the Scandinavian joint expedition to Nubia in, um, uh, in the 1960s under the UNESCO. And, um, and again, I mean, Ali, I think, already mentioned uh, the word salvage and kind of, uh, in this case, of course, uh, these objects would, uh, would, you know, and these sites would really perish um, because of the um, because of the project of modernization. And that's, I think, something that Ali and I have also been discussing uh, a long time ago, that there's, of course, many ruins and, you know, a lot of destruction and violence that happens uh, because of war and conflict. But there's also a lot of heritage that disappears because of modernization. And um, when I saw the Nubian collection of Gustav Anum for the first time, I was already talking with Ali and he was at early stages of working in the film in Sudan that is also connected to another dam also on the Nile. And I thought this was a very you know interesting connection to... Um, so it was really starting from there. And then um, I met my colleague, Mariam El Mazahi, who is a uh, curator, uh, Egyptian-American curator, and we started building up this project, which we hope will take place next year at the Uppsala Art Museum. <laughs> we do hope. <laughs> OK, so the time is really running, running away. Is there someone who would like to add another thing for for this wonderful discussion is, is there uh, i maybe just closing? wanted to say a few words about the restitution because it's a topic mm. i think mm. all museums are dealing with uh, and I, I mean it's very interesting the, this question i mean this question is a very important question especially when it's a legal also question because some of these objects were actually stolen you know there's a legal issue in hand that has to be uh, corrected uh, but also there's a tricky i mean uh, a tricky uh, um, uh, like a um, uh, zone where about uh, this idea of restitution which uh, i'm not very comfortable with, with this idea of these objects returning to a certain authentic origin and it's this idea of placing it's like the museum is a threshold of before and after like when when object objects when they are returned to the otherness, to the this other place, they become, you know, in their uh, natural, more, uh, you know, like where they should be as an, you know, like an, uh, as their original uh, place. And I think the reality is way more complex than that. I mean, it's, of course, there's the colonial history, but also there is 
ever since colonialism, there's also other uh, histories that happen in, the, uh, in these places. I mean, I can speak a bit about, uh, you know, the, uh, the Arab uh, region, how uh, the uh, archaeology and, you know, writing history was really part of the uh, pan-Arabism, you know, like uh, uh, the nationalist, uh, uh, the, the Arab national, uh, nationalist uh, project, uh, and the, how these, uh, the history was part of, of oppressive regimes. Uh, you can think of, you know, like uh, uh, in uh, Libya with Omar Qazafi, in uh, in Syria with the Assad uh, family. I mean, all these uh, all these oppressive regime have used history and archaeology in order to to you know impose you know uh, 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 a very harsh uh, 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 authority on their people. So it's it's and when these objects you know are moved from one. Ideology, ideological institution, which is, let's say, the Louvre, let's just give an example, back to, let's say, a national museum where uh, where they belong. For me, I mean, they're just moving, shifting from one one ideology to the other, uh, which, I, as an art, I'm, I'm sure it's important maybe for history and for legal uh, and uh, 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 purposes. But for me, as an artist, I'm not interested in how these objects would function in one ideology or another, but I'm more interested when they are escape any ideology and when they break free in a way uh, outside of these, you know, dogmatic regimes. Uh, so it's it's. It's it's a very interesting and complex question, I think. And maybe we can also uh, close uh, end with the image of the grafting um, mm. F that we have in the in the exhibition, uh, because um, that's maybe one one way for you, Ali, to 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 free the object <laughs> to mm. also uh, create an an uh, encounter between um, different objects from from well yeah. natural history and and uh, archaeology yeah. or or we're creating a new story sort yeah. of yeah and through the grafting i mean like in botany when you graft two different species or even a human being when you graft an an organ uh, in order to make a new species or to live or to survive so it's i call these forms of graftings of two uh two two forms of, you know, like, uh, well, if you want to call them nature and culture coming together uh, to create a new life. Mm. Okay. I'm thinking about so, the, oh, the botany of death, of yeah. course, uh, oh. but now it's the botany of life. Yeah, yeah. of Chris Markers. Yeah. Uh, uh, statues also die, of course. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank for you. this wonderful talk and uh, welcome to the museum when when it's open again hopefully soon it will open hopefully soon. looking forward to that yeah thank you thank you thank, thank you, you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye.